do something for the first time, it's always a little nervous, and uh, this was Sean's first time to be up here on a platform singing. He did great, didn't he? <laughs> Amen. Good job, brother. Amen. <clears throat> I remember when he was just this tall, and uh, so he's grown up in this church, and you're doing good. We hope that you're a regular up here. Yeah. Amen. Well, good. Thank you. I, I asked your sister, I said, hey, you did good, and she said, yeah, I did. <laughs> so there you go. Well, hey, a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, in your bulletin, there is an insert about Brave Books. And uh, it's a place where you can buy books and trust for your children. You have grandchildren, you have children, you want them to have good reading material. That's not always easy to find today, so that will help you, and I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Next week is Mother's Day, and you know, some of you have children that don't go to church, mothers that don't have kids here, and you want them to come. And most of the time, they'll say, Mom, what do you want for Mother's Day? And all you have to do is say one thing, I want you to come to church with me, amen? So uh, I will share a simple gospel message out of uh, John chapter 3, famous story about Nicodemus. And I'll tell you that story and share the gospel in the midst of all the singing, so we'll have a great time next week on Mother's Day. Hope that you're here for that. And then uh, our reading this uh, month is 2 Corinthians 1 through 6. And I hope you're following along on our reading plan and some tremendous promises in the first six chapters of 2 Corinthians. So I hope that you'll read that this month. We're reading the, uh, those six chapters every day. Uh, throughout this month, and so I hope that you'll continue to do that with us. Next week, I'll be back in Elijah, and we'll continue to study some Old Testament stuff. This week, as I shared with you last week, uh, Kirby Shepherd is coming to uh, speak to us, and he is. Uh, we have asked him to think about this position as the associate pastor of our church, and so we had a great time with a Q&A with him, with our leadership yesterday. And uh, he is here with his family, uh, Michaela. And so would you stand, Michaela? And, and uh, there she is. Good. So, brother. Thanks, man. Well, I'm really excited to be here with you guys this morning. Um, by show of hands, do I have any veterans that are here? Anybody? Keep your, uh, keep your hand raised if you're an officer. Good, you guys are going to enjoy this. <laughs> All right, so uh, I am actually uh, in the Army. I'm still in the Army Reserves. And over this last month, since April 12th, I have been, uh, I have been doing some training down in Fort Harrison. Well, uh, that's in Helena. So in Fort Harrison, they have this thing called Muscle Mountain. Um, it's this real steep hill. And uh, basically anywhere you go in Montana, you can see on a hill somewhere, there's a letter that's up there. It's usually the first letter of the, uh, of the town that you're in or maybe a school. Uh, well, in Fort Harrison, currently they have, uh, actually they finished today, they have an OCS class, an officer candidate school class that's going through. I'm an enlisted guy myself, and I spent uh, uh, eight years in special operations, so I know what shenanigans look like. And uh, so... The, the officer candidates, the officer that's over the whole program, makes sure, he, he tells these guys, if those letters that are up on that hill, on Muscle Mountain, are do not say OCS, you're going to have a bad time. So like I said, I like shenanigans. And, uh, and so I enlisted my class, and we went up the hill, and uh, we changed it to what we wanted it to be. And uh, as we're coming back down, we see all these soldiers, they've got their, they're, they're in full battle rattle, they got their helmets, they got their plate carriers, they got their rucksacks on, their weapons, and they're just running down the hill, or down the road, and they have to run and sprint up this hill, and it's a steep hill, and uh, to try and change this before their cadre members see that it's been changed from OCS. And so uh, they're going back down, and like, man, that was really quick, but you guys should not have let me see you doing that. Uh, so as soon as they got back down, they're going into the chow hall, hopefully drinking some warm milk, and we changed the letters back. And then we changed the letters back again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And finally, they're starting to get wise on, on these things, and they're thinking, you know, uh, we got to figure out how to, how to get, get back at them so that they are not constantly changing these letters. And while they were up there changing the letters, we stole their commander's guide on. 
The commander's guide on, if you don't know, it's a flag that uh, carries the honor of the, the unit or the regiment that they're with, and it's a big deal. So uh, we took this, and their commander is this small little lady. She's the nicest lady that I've ever met in my entire life, and they've just been having a good time up until we decided to interfere with everything that's going on, and uh, she's been real kind with them. I've never seen her uh, lose her, her composure or anything, but she is screaming at these guys, and they're out there crawling through the mud and everything like that, and they're low crawling and doing bear crawls, and they've got all their gear on. I'm like, man, that looks like it's a really tough time. I'm glad I'm not you. And, uh, and so they're just having a tough time. And finally, uh, they, they end up getting their guide on back, and, and we change it again. And this, this class started off with uh, uh, 19 people, and they ended with six. And so, and so we, uh, we told them, hey, you know, you, uh, you might not be the sharpest officer. You might not be the sharpest tool in the tool shed, but uh, you sure are going to be the strongest. So we have had a really great time doing that, and that's kind of been uh, what my weekend uh, or what my last couple of weeks have looked like is harassing these officers. So uh, you can trust that they are getting some good training from some solid NCOs. And uh, all right, so this morning I'm going to have us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If, uh, if, you, if you are going to, we can follow along in the verses, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, in verses 19 and 20 through 27. Okay, so 1 Corinthians um, is Paul writing a letter to this church, and he's kind of taking them behind the woodshed. They have a lot of problems in Corinth, and there's a number of issues within their church. Uh, they have these guys that Paul addresses kind of at the beginning of the letter, um, and he explains that their leadership is off. Their leadership has been leading these guys astray. They have a myriad of things that are, are wrong in the church, like the way that they administer the Lord's Supper. And basically, they had these big goblets of wine and giant turkey legs for the Lord's Supper. And man, who wouldn't want to come to that kind of thing if you're going to get a giant goblet of wine and a turkey leg? Uh, so these guys were basically the first Baptists. They're the real feed them and they'll come types. <laughs> so the place is packed, and Paul is looking around, and he's saying, hey, you're, you're doing it wrong. Your heart is not right with this issue. And he addresses this heart issue that the, uh, the Corinthians have. And he goes through this dissertation with the church where he's correcting these doctrinal issues uh, and they're just moving from topic to topic on what things should be, what the church should look like. So we get all the way to chapter 9 and Paul is talking there about Christian liberties and that the Corinthians were complaining about uh, these, these guys in the church that were eating these pagan meats, these things that had been sacrificed to, uh, to idols. Uh, and uh, they're telling that these new converts that this is not right. And Paul is basically saying, hey, as a Christian, you have the liberty to do that now. Uh, to the Jews in the church, he's saying, hey, we can eat baby back ribs now. It's okay. Go ahead and dig in. And so he's explaining that uh, they have the liberty to do that. And he gets to this point right before where I'm going to be reading this morning, and he says something that is peculiar. And I want you to listen to me, church, because at the, at the heart of the thing, at the heart of Christian liberty, this is the heart of it. And he, he, he's basically telling the Corinthians, do not be a stumbling block to the person that is sitting next to you. And so he'll explain this, and he'll talk about the gospel, and he'll talk about our need for intensity and a need for a sense of urgency that we need to have as believers in sharing the gospel. So Paul is on uh, one of his missionary journeys, and he's going through Corinth, uh, and he understands the city. Corinth is this city that has easy access to the Mediterranean. It's a packed city. It, uh, it's a wealthy city, and it thrives on trade and its cultural diversity. Uh, that's, uh, there's Jews there. There's Greeks there. There's all these different other cultures that create this mixed congregation uh, in the church. So he's there on this hill, and he looks down, uh, and he would have seen this scene. And if you were there uh, in this particular uh, time in history, then you would see this great field, and in it is the precursor to what we have today as the Olympics. It's called the Ismanian Games. And the Ismanian Games, uh, were, there were these guys who would train, and they would train, and they would train for two years nonstop, and if they would win the games, they would receive this wreath that would be placed on their head, and they would be treated like Caesar for two years. You could have anything that you wanted, wine, woman, song, whatever it was that your heart desired, you would be treated like Caesar, and this was your reward for winning the games. So Paul is looking down on the scene, and he's getting ready to pen the scripture, and he's likening our faith uh, as we portray the gospel to the world. And we get there, and we find some interesting things, this competition that's going on. 
So I want to get to the scripture, but I want to uh, relate to you first two stories because I'm going to refer to these stories a little later on. Okay, so the first story I want to relate to you happened in 1983, and it involved two track clubs, uh, the Santa Monica Track Club and Nike International. Both teams had a premier runner on their team who would go to the Olympics uh, for the 4 by one 100 meter relay in the 1984 Olympics a year later. Nike International was anchored by a man by the name of Calvin Smith. This guy would qualify in the 84 Olympics for both the uh, 200 and the 400 meter races, and he would get a silver medal in both events. On this day, however, in 1983, a year before, he was the anchor for the 4 by uh, 100 meter relay for Nike International. Now, the anchor leg for the Santa Monica Track Club uh, was the current world record holder of the 100 meter dash by a guy by the name of Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis was the fastest man in the world at the time. Not only was he the fastest man in the world, he was the fastest man in the world by three-tenths of a second. Now, three-tenths of a second doesn't sound like very much, but in the 100-meter dash, that's from about here to that flagpole right there. And so that's quite the lead. Uh, so he had that much of a lead on the next fastest man alive. So Nike International knew coming into this relay that there was no way that they were going to beat uh, beat the Santa Monica Track Club, unless they had a sizable lead by the time that Carl Lewis and Calvin Smith took off. In this relay, these guys, each running 100, meter, uh, 100 meters, knew that they had to secure the victory in the first 300 meters, or they wouldn't stand a chance when it came to running against Carl Lewis. Calvin Smith knew this. And if you were there on that particular day in history, you would have seen something pretty interesting. Nike International, knowing what they were up against, could be seen on the track club doing what's called the cadence, uh, cadence drills. They were running behind each other, systematically calling out, stick, baton, and they'd take the baton and pass it uh, forward in the line. And when the baton reached the, the lead man, he would set it down at his feet as he was running, and they would continue on until the man in the rear came along, and he would pick it up, and they would continue the drill. And they would do lap after lap, uh, passing this baton off and uh, doing this drill. Okay, so uh, if you were there, you... In the middle of the track, you would have seen the Santa Monica Track Club, Carl Lewis and his guys out in the middle of the field stretching. History tells us that a young man went to Carl Lewis and he said, hey, are you going to practice uh, your handoff? And Carl Lewis's response in 1983 to this young man was, boy, we haven't lost the 4 by 100 meter relay in three years, and we're not about to lose it today. The young man thinks, well, he's the fastest man in the world, so I'm not going to argue with him. Um, and so if, had you been there, that's what you would have heard. Both men, both teams get on the track and this dual meet. Nike International would take lane two. And the premier team, the Santa Monica Track Club, who held the record, would take lane one. The gun goes off. Nike International gets a lead from about where I'm, I'm standing now to that first speaker and the first uh, 100 meters. It's a pretty good lead. They need that lead if they're going to have a chance. First exchange. They extend, they extend the lead about another four feet for, to here. History tells us that at this point, fans are standing up in the bleachers. This could be an upset. But in the second exchange of the baton, Santa Monica Track Club catches up and they tie Nike International. Everyone knows that there is no chance that Calvin Smith is going to beat Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis, who is a full three-tenths of a second faster than Calvin Smith, the second fastest man in the world. Calvin Smith's two silver medals uh, the following year in the Olympics would only be silver because Carl Lewis would be the one who beat him in both events. But on this particular day, a year early, earlier, history writes that something interesting occurred. Both men simultaneously take the baton. Stick! Baton! And they would both take off at the same time. If you were there on that particular day of history, you would have seen Carl Lewis's hand come forward, hit his leg, and drop the baton. Calvin Smith would run past him, and for the first time in three years, there would be an upset in this race, and Santa Monica Track Club would re lose the four by 100 meter relay. That's story number one. Story number two. There's a guy by the name of, uh, this story takes place in 1923. There's a guy by the name of Eric Little. Eric Little was a missionary to China, and he was born to a missionary family. Eric was a pretty curious guy. Eric uh, had never lost a race in his life, and he was a devout Christian. 
He was known all over Europe, and there was a dual meet going on for the, uh, the qualifier for the 1924 Olympics, which would occur in Paris for the 400-meter uh, relay. Eric Littlebit would be running against France's uh, number one guy on their team, Pierre Viteron. Pierre Viteron knew Eric Little. He knew that Eric had never lost a race. So Pierre Viteron decided to do something, history tells us, that would forever cement his name in the record books. He was going to cheat. You see, there was no camera in those days and, uh, to film the event. Rather, they would have two officials on either corner of the, the track. The official's job was to make sure that everybody uh, was in their lane to ensure that their feet stayed in their lane. Eric Little had lane one. Pierre Viteron had lane two. In those days, they did a waterfall start, so they all were basically kind of lined up next to each other at the start. So the one, when the gun goes off, they start going into the first corner. Pierre Viteron's plan is to push and shove Eric down while the official was looking at the outside lanes. So on the inside of the lane, he does exactly that. Eric goes down. Fans are at gas. They can't believe it. And the officials didn't know what was going on. There's, the fans are screaming, foul, foul. And what happened next had never occurred in the history of track and field and would never happen again. Let's take a look. History tells us that he actually lost consciousness for about 30 minutes. And then when he was interviewed afterwards, he said that he had lost all ability in his own right to do anything. So he pointed his face to the heavens, and with his head in the air and pumping his hands as hard as he could, he said that he didn't know where he was on the track. When he was asked why he did that, he said, I realized at 300 meters, I had nothing left. And if I was going to cross that finish line, it was going to be by God's grace. And he won. Two stories, two different thoughts. One man trusted himself, the other put his trust in God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to look at this interesting insight that Scripture gives us that Paul, as he's uh, equipping uh, the Corinthians to be able to tell the Corinthians how they should look, and we're going to pick up in verse 19, which says this, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. Paul's talking here about the idea of salvation. He's talking about the importance of how we share our faith. And he's talking about the intensity and the purposeful intentionality to be, uh, that we must have in order to bring the gospel to the world. Look at verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. 
to those that are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those that are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. Paul's simply referencing here the fact that he's Jewish. He's a Pharisee. In fact, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul was trained under a guy by the name of Gamaliel, one of the foremost theologians of, of his time. It's kind of like going to Harvard School of Theology, back when Harvard was decent. Uh, <laughs> he was the guy who was educated better than everyone else. He understood what it was like, and he understood, that the, uh, he understood the law and where the Jew was coming from. But then he says to the guy who's not a Jew, he says to the, to the pagan person, to that person who never understood the law at all, ne- at all and never grew up with it, he was saying that he, he was the same way and he could relate to them as well. In other words, he's saying, it doesn't matter to me if you don't know the church lingo when you come in here. It doesn't matter to me that you can't walk on water because, because listen, church, no one walks on water. Nobody in this room walks on water. I don't walk on water. You don't walk on water. I sinned yesterday. I sinned today. I'm going to sin tomorrow, not because I'm purposing to do it in my heart, but because I'm a human being just like you. And scripture says that all men fall short of the glory of God. Amen? And so Paul understood this when he says, I can resonate with you, uh, and it doesn't matter that you're eating baby back ribs. I'm going to sit down at the table with that guy, and I'm going to eat those baby back ribs with him. He's saying, that's not going to be a stumbling block for me because the most important thing over everything else is that I would be able to bring the gospel to that person and they would be able to understand it. Look again at verse 20. And to the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. Listen, church, if you walk out of here with anything, let it be this. We as Christians cannot be building a a church that is a club. We cannot be building a church that is a club. We are to reach those people who are outside that are dying without Christ. Our focus must be them. Your reward in heaven is not the streets of gold. It's not the roofs of gold. It's, it's not talking about how great it's going to be for us. What Jesus, when Jesus says, look around for your reward is great, he's talking about those kids. He's talking about those cousins. He's talking about those family members that are there with you. That is your reward. Those people who come to know Christ for having seen him through you. The people at your workplace. The people who are growing up next to you. The little boy who pulls on your pant leg and says, Dad, I want to be just like you when you grow up. That should scare the life out of us. When the little girl comes up and she she pulls on your skirt and says, Mama, I want to be just like you. That should scare the life out of us. We need to be living our lives in such a way before our children and before the people that we're around that they're able to see Jesus Christ in us. And when you let yourself, your education, your job, your status, your social life, your money, whatever it is, when you let your your life, if that becomes what defines you, you could become a stumbling block. Why? Because that person doesn't have those things. The only thing that is equal at the cross, the only thing that, that levels the cross is Jesus Christ himself. And let me tell you, the ground is level at the cross. Amen? Can I get a better amen? Listen, church, what Paul is trying to convey to the church at Corinth is that they had to, uh, they had created a church that was defined by fun and with sensationalism and these rules that gave it this sort of, the, this club mentality. And he's like, hey, you know, if you want to, if you want to come uh, and be part of the cool club, you guys come over here. But Paul's saying that is not going to get anybody into heaven. Look at verse 22. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. Translation today, 2023, right where you're at, all of us, all of us need to be prepared to do whatever it takes to get people to say, man, what makes you different? What is it that makes you different from me? Now, I've not been a preacher for very long, uh, but I've been serving in the ministry now in some shape or form for about six years. Uh, my father is also a pastor, and our family owns this business, that, uh, this discipleship business that helps churches grow. Uh, we find that oftentimes in many churches, we find that these churches, the, the people have gotten complacent, and they've become okay with the idea that I just want to come here and be fed myself, but I don't want to learn how to serve. And there's nothing, there is nothing in Scripture that is taught like that. 
A pastor's role is to equip and train the saints to do the work of the ministry. It's the saints' job to do the work of the ministry, according to Ephesians chapter 4. And those roles must be working together hand in hand in order to propagate the gospel. It cannot be just one person doing all the work. It requires us, everybody here sitting in the, in the chairs, it requires the work of the saints to propagate the gospel. Look at verse 23. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. And then Paul pivots in his dissertation here, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run the race all run, uh, that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Now, if you're the note-taking type, put an asterisk next to verse 24. Do you understand what that says? It says that God didn't ask you to win the race. He asks you to run in such a way as to win the race. And he's speaking through his servant here, Paul, who's writing this epistle to the church uh, at Corinth in order to fix some doctrinal issues. And Paul is saying, look, God is not asking you to be perfect. He's not asking you to win the race, but, but he is asking you to run in such a way as to win. He's asking you to do your very best. If we can go to bed every night and say, I have done my very best for the kingdom, then we can go to bed and we can sleep well and we have done well. But when we don't run at all, when we, when we're not trying at all, God's saying, what, what are we doing? Are, are we just, are we just becoming witnesses to everything that is going on around us? Are we just sitting on the sidelines and never getting in the game? Are we simply watching somebody else do what we were called to do? When Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave us the Great Commission. He said, Go therefore and disciple all nations, making, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to catch something out of Matthew chapter 28. He's saying that we are to build relationships first in an intentional discipleship fashion. And then after that, the person that you have uh, is going to come to know Jesus Christ and you're going to baptize them. But we start the relationship first before they ever come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we have to build a relationship with our community in order for our community to grow. You're incredibly fortunate to have a man of God like Pastor Bruce here who preaches on all of the Bible. Because it clearly shows in the conversations that I've had a chance to have with some of you. And, but to my knowledge, there is no perforated edition of the Bible. We can't just tear out the pages of the Bible that we don't like just because we don't like them. There are certainly going to be parts in Scripture that are tough to swallow. There are certainly going to be parts that are going to rub you the wrong way. There are going to be parts of the Bible that just flat out bug you. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to hear some of those parts someday, and you're going to think, man, I don't, I don't know that I want to go to that church anymore. I don't like what that guy had to say. But it's not what I have to say. It's not what Pastor Bruce has to say. It's what Scripture has to say. Amen? It's what God has to say to us this morning. So Paul refines this down, and he says, I want you to understand that you are not asked to win the race, but you are to run the race in such a way as to win it, the prize. Look at verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable crown, a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Paul is referring again to these Isthmian games that were going on down there. These guys are competing to get this wreath like Caesar to wear around their heads so that they can be treated like God for two years. And he's saying, you are striving and you are striving and you are working uh, and you are going to drive yourself into the ground so that you can what? So that you can get a house? So you can get, get a, a cooler car? To, so that you can get your retirement account just to right where it needs to be? What is it that we are striving for? What is it that we are putting all of our eggs into one basket in order to make that one thing, which is, listen to me, that one thing that is just temporary and and it's fleeting like a vapor. But what we are striving for, listen, church, what we are striving for is eternal. What God can do in your heart will change you for the rest of your life. 
I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are, except for the fact that you need to be at an age where you can at least understand the lordship of Jesus Christ because that's what it really comes down to. Your salvation is not predicated on you knowing Jesus Christ because even the demons believe who Jesus Christ is, but they're not going to heaven. He's not their Lord. Our salvation is predicated on us choosing to say, I am choosing to make Jesus Christ my Lord. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. We get an insight here from Paul uh, that we have to be intentional and we have to have a plan. Verse 26, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. In other words, we have to have a direction. The Bible tells us over and over again from the Old Testament to the New, if we do not have a vision, the church will perish. If there is no vision, the people will perish. So what is it that we are doing as the saints? Not as preachers and teachers, because I promise you, Pastor Bruce has a God-given plan. But what are we doing as the believers? Are we just sitting here holding up and saying, hey, this place is pretty, this is a pretty comfortable place to be. May it never be. Our plan is that guy in front of us at the checkout stand at the, uh, at the store who's with his kid and he can't afford to get all of his groceries. And you hear that still small voice uh, telling you to cover it. And you're sitting there in line looking at your bank account like, man, I don't even know if I can cover it. And when they're walking away after you've, you've bought their groceries and they're confused as to why a complete stranger would do something like that, Perhaps that is the first time in their lives that they have ever seen what unconditional love truly is. And the world cannot understand that. But that unconditional love comes from Jesus Christ, from the Holy Spirit that indwells you. Listen to me, church. That spirit-fueled, unconditional love, that is our driver. It was Paul's driver. And our actions, our actions do in fact speak louder than our words. I counsel with a lot of young men and couples, and uh, especially when they're early on in their, their Christianity, and I, I share with them, man, maybe you don't go around telling everybody you're a Christian. The reason why is because you go around telling everybody, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to such and such a church. And the moment that you make a mistake, the moment that you fall on your face, that person that you were trying to witness to says, I knew it! I knew you were just like me. And if that's what your Christianity is, you can keep it. But if you don't say anything, and you buy the groceries, you cause them to wonder what it is that drives you. So when they turn around and they say, man, I... Why did, you, why did you do that? Because that's what Christ would have done. And now not only have you reached him, but you've reached his child, and you've reached the cashier and anybody else that's watching. And when they go to bed at night wondering why someone would do that, when they go to bed wondering, why would somebody do that for me? All they can think of is Jesus Christ. Look at the last verse as we close. We're actually going to read verse 26 again. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Have you ever been disqualified in a race? Paul is likening uh, it to our faith and to our witness. You're yelling at the kids. Your marriage is falling apart. You have a wayward son or daughter. Your job's not going the right way. You just get laid off. You lose your attitude in the workplace and say, you know what, I can't stand this place anyway. You guys have treated me like dirt the entire time and I can't stand it. And they know from a year prior that you are a Christian. Or you're fighting with your wife and you say, you know what? You just want to leave? Then leave! Everything that we do 
will depend on how well we hang, hand off that baton. Because your legacy, your legacy is going to echo in eternity whether you like it or not. Our driver to do the right thing, to discipline our bodies and to make it our slave is so that we can hand off that baton to our children, to our family, to the people around us, every time, and to execute it well. And it will be because, it will be because of who Jesus Christ is in our lives. Jesus walked into Jerusalem on purpose as the band comes forward and gets ready. Jesus walked into purpose to walk into Jerusalem on, on intentionally, and he's in front of Pontius Pilate in court. Pontius Pilate, who doesn't even like the Jews, says, tell me that you're innocent and I'm letting you go. And scripture says that he's silent. He doesn't say anything. Just say you're innocent! And Jesus just stands there. And I can only imagine what the other two criminals are thinking. What is wrong with you? He's giving you an out. Just take it. Later on on the hill, both of those guys are next to Jesus, and some, one of them says, hey, if you really are God, then get me off of here. And the Bible says that Jesus didn't say anything to him. But the other one says this, remember me when you get to your heaven. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He wasn't baptized. He was a criminal. He didn't know anything about doctrine or theology. He didn't go to the next steps class. But at the acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God, remember me when you get to your heaven. Jesus said, you are going to be with me in paradise. Listen, church. Your salvation is had when you decide to put a line in the sand and say, I'm going to make Jesus Christ my Lord. You can know a lot about Jesus Christ. That's not going to save you. I'm a walking testament of that truth. We can take all the sins of everybody in this room and put them on a pile in the middle of the room and have Kirby Shepherd's sins piled up right next to it, and I promise my pile is going to be a lot bigger than yours. But it's a true statement that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and that in me as the foremost of all, his perfect patience might be demonstrated for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And when you say, I'm going to choose to follow him with all that I am, and I'm going to live for you, Lord, in the, in the best way that I can, I will run the race in such a way as to win. In a moment, Pastor Bruce is going to lead us in an altar call as everyone gets ready. And as we prepare our hearts, I want to encourage you to just ask the Holy Spirit what it is that he's trying to say to you through the message this morning and to trust that he will make it known to you. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to stand up in a few minutes, in a few moments, and, and you're going to wrestle with that in your heart. And Pastor Bruce is going to ask some of us to come pray at the, at, the, at the stage. He's going to ask us to come forward and to pray, and you're going to be wrestling with that, that in your heart. That's not for me. I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I'll, I'll look silly if I walk down the aisle, but Jesus Christ is asking you and he is purposing for you to take that first step and to follow him. He is purposing for you to make a decision and to step forward and not to win the race, but to run in such a way as to win the race. And as you're struggling, you're going to hear that voice in your head telling you, don't go up there. People are watching. Don't do it. But I want to tell you, block it out. Listen to that still, small voice. And you come when Pastor Bruce gives the invitation. Before I finish, I want to just pray with all of you. And Father, I lift up to you every man, woman, and child in this church, and I ask that you would rest your hand mightily upon them. Build them up to be the people that you have called them to be. Convict where conviction is due, and comfort where comfort is due. That we might all learn to run the race and to pass the baton on to the next generation. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen.
Amen. Would you stand for just a moment? <clears throat> when you invite Jesus into your life, you enter into a race. He calls us to run a race not against somebody else. It's just your race. He's called you to run the purpose that he's called you for. And like me, all of us have had people bump us and we have fallen down and we got hurt by somebody in the church or somebody that we were looking up to and they disappointed us. And thus, we've also had a time when we, maybe in overconfidence, dropped the baton. We've dropped the baton by not being what we know Jesus wants us to be. And sometimes we do it on purpose. And so I want you to know this morning that <clears throat> one of the things that we sang about is that we are glad God loves us. And when your kids, your children, your grandchildren, when they drop the baton, what do we do? We say, hey, hey, I love you. Go get that baton, pick it up. Come on, stand up, let's go. And we encourage them. And God wants you to know, you're not gonna run the race perfectly, but he wants you to get back up. Don't quit. Don't let somebody's lifestyle Somebody who didn't do right cause you to stop doing what's right. So this morning, there's not a better place, there's not a safer place, there's not an easier place to pray than right here on Sunday morning. So if there's something that needs to get right in your heart between you and Jesus, man, just come forward, kneel here and pray, and you get it worked out with the Lord. And uh, you'll be better because of it. So let's, uh, let's bow our heads, and as they sing, you need to do some business with the Lord. Your life is not where it ought to be. You've dropped the baton in some area of your life. Then why don't you come and just say, Lord, help me to pick it up again. Help me to start walking with you again. Come right ahead and pray. Come now. Come with a friend. Amen. That a, that's wonderful. Just come and pray. I promise you, the Lord will meet you here. Amen. Lord loves you today. He brought you here to say, I love you. Jesus said that if you'll take a step toward me, I will draw near to you. But you have to take that first step. You have to initiate by coming. He said, come, over and over again, come. You that are weary and you're broken and you're hurting, come, let me love on you. If you're out of sorts with the Lord, would you come and just confess that to the Lord between you and him? We'll sing one more verse. You come right now. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be.
Heavenly Father, we are, we are all <clears throat> in this race together. And there are people in the world that have no clue how much you love them. That your grace is all that they need. And I pray this week you would help us just to be a witness by caring, by doing a kind act for someone. May we smile a little bit more. May we love a little bit more. May we forgive a little bit more. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to know we are missionaries in the world trying to share your light. So help us to think about our life. We are to represent you. If we have you in our hearts, then we are to represent you. Everything we do should be Christ-like. And if it's not, then we should stop. So I pray that you would bless us by obeying you, walking with you, and watching what you do when we walk in the light. Father, thank you for this time, for the message, and pray that you would help us to live it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Kirby did good. Hello, I'm Pastor Bruce Spear from Cross Point Church. I want to thank you for tuning in and watching one of our messages. We do hope that the teaching of the Word of God will impact your life and cause you to want to walk closer to the Lord Jesus. I hope that you will also consider supporting the Cross Point ministry so that we can do more for the cause of Christ. If you have questions about your spiritual walk, especially about how to invite Jesus into your life, I hope that